How you guys doing tonight? You happy to be in the house of God? It's a good place to be, to find yourself during the week. Am I loud? Can y'all hear me? All right. Y'all good? Y'all good? Okay. Well, if you don't know, my name is Landon. I'm on staff here at Beyond Church. Happy to be a part, and uh, I'm just so happy for you to get to see my face tonight and hear me, hear my voice. How blessed are you? Come on. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You finally get a positive response out of that. Yeah, that's, that's great. Appreciate that. Uh, Pastors Nate and Evan, they're actually at uh, Winter Bible tonight and at Rama, so they're, they're getting fed over there. Uh, but we're going to get fed here tonight from God's Word, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'll just kind of let you in on the process a little bit. For me, I love teaching God's Word. You know, one of the things that I know that God's called me to do is to teach His Word, and that, that's uh, an awesome responsibility. It's a responsibility, though, and uh, it's something that you got to take seriously, and I'll admit, you know, there's been spans in my life where I haven't as much, and sometimes you'll get asked to teach, and it's not that exciting. You know why? It's work. It's work. You know, I don't know if many of you are, are in, just let you in on, on the process a little bit. You know that uh, pastors, whoever's teaching week in and week out, they don't just come up with that message just right. It's like work throughout the week, if you care about it, if you care to hear from the Lord, and you care to deliver the, the message that he's given you, right? And so, uh, for me, I'm a little more, uh, I, I have things laid out, I typically, I'm a little more topical, I have something, I have messages from the past, I have stuff that I lean on, that I rely on, I have things that God uh, usually has me focus on more, and it wasn't like that this time, so it was super uncomfortable. In fact, I had no idea what we were going to talk about until, you know, about sometime later this morning. So this is, we'll just see how it goes, Right? So I'm letting y'all in now so you know, so we'll, we'll just see. But I like that, you know what, I leaned into it a little bit because I, it's, it, I, I didn't listen to other messages, I didn't try to go get something somewhere else, I just was trusting the Lord to get what he wanted to get to us tonight. Sometimes you just have to wait a little bit longer to hear from him if you really want, and, and this is what I'm talking about, you've heard me talk about it recently, I think there are answers here. I mentioned it on Sunday about people getting here on Wednesday nights. I think there are answers here. Yeah. And if you truly want answers for people who, who have all these questions and they're wanting answers, it baffles me that, that they think they, they know the answer is found with God, but they don't find themselves under God's word and under his authority. How can you expect to get answers when you're not placing yourself in the place where there's answers? And so I, let's just expect tonight that we're going to get answers from God's Word. That, that's my expectation. And so I went into it, and, you know, I, was, I just sat down, and I said, Lord, what? I mean, I had one, I had one scripture that I knew I wanted to bring up that I knew was something that, that's been on the inside of me, and it's something that's kind of been um, a theme for a little bit for, for, for us here at Beyond Church um, and for me personally uh, but that was it. So one scripture, I'm like, Lord, that won't preach very long. I think, I think they might like me if I just read that one and we get out of here. But I mean, come on, let's let's get, let's do a little more. And so, he, and, and I just felt I just felt led to read Jeremiah. So I went to Jeremiah and I read six six chapters. Jeremiah has long chapters. Y'all better be glad we're not doing an Old Testament Bible reading. A lot of y'all would have given up by now. I'm telling you, it. Well, I read six chapters, and I'm not kidding. I was sitting in my chair. I read six chapters. I'm like, oh, I'm getting kind of sleepy. And uh, I, kinda, I was like, six is enough. I put it down. I closed my eyes for a minute. And I said, all right, I can't read Jeremiah anymore. Lord, is there enough here, what I read? So there was. There was some good stuff. There were, there were three different verses that uh, I want to get to. Uh, and the, the, top, the title of tonight's message is, Give Me the Truth. Say, Give Me the Truth. Me the truth. Do you want the truth? Yes. You want the truth, don't you? See, I think that um, a lot of times we think, I don't really want the truth. I want you to tell me what I want to hear. But deep down, you know you want the truth. And you know you got to have the truth instead of just hearing what you want to hear. It's pretty sickening the people who actually like to live in an echo chamber. And just, I want to hear what I think, and I want people to echo back to me what I think and what I feel. Oh, that's kind of gross, and we don't want that, do we? We want what God says. I've got some stuff happening here. All right, let's go to um, 
Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah 3. And so this is just one, uh, I just wanted to hit this up front. This is just one that I ran across today. We've heard this before. This is something uh, that we believe around here. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, it says, And I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will guide you with knowledge and understanding. Aren't you thankful for this? I think this is one of the most underrated and amazing gifts from God to the body of Christ. God said, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. This is, this is so amazing. And I've heard recently of, of a few people, you know, like if you have a family member getting baptized at another church somewhere, you're out of town, you visit another church. Uh, how many of you have, have ever done this? You maybe have been planted here for a little bit and you're at another church for uh, some other reason. You're like, man, it's not that this place stinks, but it's, this stinks for me, right? I want to get back home, right? Yeah, and this is why right here. Because when, you're, when God's called you to a place, the, the pastor that he has set over you has his heart for you and words specifically for you, right? And it's not that at another church, they may, it may not be great and they may not be preaching the word, but that word's not going to hit you like it's going to hit here because it's, it's tailored for you, from God to you, Right? And so I hope that you kind of get that sense if if that's ever happened to you. That's why right there. I mean, we eat primo around here. Like like the food gets seasoned, it gets marinated, it's slow cooked, and then we eat good and it's served with love. We eat good around here. Now, look, it's not just like, oh, they feed feed you what you want, it's really good. We get all of our vegetables too around here. We get all of them, but, but it's healthy and it's good for us. And that's what I was talking about. There's time spent getting that, getting that word prepared for us, for you. This is for your life. And there is an actual tangible uh, benefit. There is something tangible that you can walk away with. Try, try if you Don't try it, but if you, like I said, if you've had that experience before, you'll know it. It's a different thing when you walk out of here on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. You've got a word from the house that God's called you to than it is you leaving somewhere else and think you just had some type of event or experience. It's real. What, what we get here is real, and it's tangible, and it's felt. Amen? And uh, this verse excites me more and more because uh, more than ever, it, it's become, you know, I work obviously very closely with Pastor Nate, and it's become abundantly clear that like this is his purpose. He, his purpose, he wants to get the word in the people here. He wants to get it in us, and he wants to get the word to the, to the lost. He wants to get the word out. More than, not, not an event, not a program, not some special project, he wants to get the word of God to people. And I love that that is our pastor's heart and focus, not, not some um, just other thing. It's the word. It's the word of God. It's the distribution of the good news to his sheep and to the lost. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Aren't you thankful to be in a house where that's the focus? All right, let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. This is what I was referring to. This was the only verse I had coming in. So we're going to open with it, and we're going to read this from the New Living first. That's what most of my reading will be done out of tonight, and then from the Passion So the New Living says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. This is good news. I love this scripture because God doesn't just, God's word isn't just good for telling you what's right and wrong in your life. What it does is if something's wrong, it instructs you, it corrects you, the Bible says, right? And I love this, especially now, because Jesus fulfilled the law, and so in him, if Jesus is the Lord of your life, you now have access to the same Holy Spirit that he had, who was able to fulfill the law, so you now have grace to do everything that God has called you to do, just like Jesus did, just like he did. You have the living word on the inside of you. You do. This is such a good scripture in the Passion. It says, God has transmitted his very substance into every scripture, for it is God-breathed. The Bible that you're holding, whatever it is, God's word, this is 
God breathed right here. His very substance is in here. It will empower you by its instruction and correction, giving you the strength to take the right direction and lead you deeper into the path of godliness. Then you will be God's servant, fully mature and perfectly prepared to fulfill any assignment God gives you. See, Scripture isn't just a book from God, about God. It it's actually it contains God. This contains God. Like, his, his, who he is is embedded into this right here. There was, um, I think one of the words here is, uh, it's, it's inspired. This is inspired by God, right? And really, what, what that means is, um, it, it just, it contains uh, the, the aroma of heaven. It contains the, the sights, the sounds, the power of heaven. It's the essence of heaven. This Bible is the essence of heaven, right here. This is God, this Bible, this is God right here. You don't ever really typically look at your Bible and say, that's God sitting over there on my coffee table. But, but God's right over there. And a lot of times God just gets left right there because we don't think that that's God. We think that's a Bible. We think that's a book. But it's God over there. And this book, it's alive. It's living. It is living. It, I, I don't know. I mean, I've been a believer for a long time now. I've read this scripture. We've done this. We've talked about it up here a lot. We focus on the word around here a lot. And I'm still amazed that this is a living word, a living, breathing, inspired word of God. That God was put himself in this right here. It's amazing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, let's turn to Jeremiah. Let's see if I got anything before I dozed off. In Jeremiah earlier, Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah 2, we're going to read verses 11 through 13. It says, Has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones, even though they are not gods at all? Yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. The heavens are shocked at such a thing and shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. This really stuck out to me, and really the, the theme reading Jeremiah chapter 1 through 6, you know, if, if you're familiar with Jeremiah chapter 1, God calls Jeremiah, he says, hey, uh, before you were knit in your mother's womb, I knew you, I appointed you, I called you, right? And uh, he's called Jeremiah to be a prophet. So Jeremiah steps out into what God's called him to do, and he comes and he gives uh, the words that God gives him to God's people, to Israel, to Judah. And as he's doing this, there was, there was it's just a lot of this about Israel leaving God, abandoning God to serve idols. And, you know, the language that was used in here a lot, there, the word that was used in here a lot, a lot was prostitute. They were prostituting themselves to basically anything and everyone and abandoning their husband, God. And this is really what the first six chapters are talking about a whole lot. And so this was just kind of really a snapshot uh, of that. But God's saying, they have done two evil things. They have uh, abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. Imagine, I mean, we know that water is obviously a precious resource. I mean, we've got to have it to stay alive, but there's an abundance of it, right, on the earth. Imagine that it's like the most precious thing ever. And you live in a nice place with a fresh, like this river behind you that's the cleanest river ever, right? And it's always running, and it always has, as long as you've been alive. And as far as you can tell, it always will. And it's clean, and it's perfect, and it's amazing. And then you pack up your stuff, and water is the, the biggest thing. Like it's the only, it's the most important thing. It's the only thing. But you pack up your stuff from there, and you go to a drier place, away from the river, and you start trying to dig a well yourself. Have you, any of you ever tried to dug a hole? <laughs> dug, dig a hole? What would I say? Have you dug a hole? Right? That's right. Dug is... What well, I said, tried to dug? <laughs> Have you tried to dug a hole before with dug, Right? All right, 
Has anyone tried to dig a hole before, right? Has anyone dug a hole before and actually did it? Is it not the worst thing ever? I heard this joke, this comedian, and I agreed with him. I laughed because it was true. I'm like, it may be the hardest thing there ever is to do is to dig a hole. <laughs> Digging a hole is terrible. It's the worst. And this is, this is what you're doing. You're, you're going away from an amazing, clean, uh, alive river of water, and you're going to go dig your own hole, which you're not good at. Like, imagine me digging a hole. And I'm like, oh, two foot, that's good. I, ain't, I can't do anymore, right? And I'm going to make a little bitty well here, and I can't make a well. Imagine me trying to make a well, a cistern, right? Relax there. <laughs> and then I'm trying to do it myself. You know that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be terrible, right? For one, it's not deep. It's not flowing. It's not alive. There's going to be cracks in it. It's going to be dirty. If there's ever any water in it at all, it'll be dirty, and that's if I get any at all. And this is, the, this is exactly what God's people were doing. They left that to do that. And it's still happening today. That's baffling, isn't it? Like, it, I mean, if we're, we're talking about it right now, you think you've got to be stupid to leave that set up to do that, Right? And yet, that's what's happening. All right, let's flip over to Jeremiah chapter 6. We're going to read something that, that you have heard here before. And man, this spoke to me today. And so we're going we're gonna to kind of spend some time here in this. I just want to read part of the first verse here. We're going to start in verse 16 and read through verse 20. It says, this is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old, godly way and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. So when we're talking about stopping at crossroads and looking around, you know, the, we know what a crossroads are. Crossroads are, hey, I'm here. I'm at a crossroads in my life. I've got a decision to make. You know, there are options. I have options, which means I have to make a decision. And you might think, well, I'm not at a crossroads in my life. There's not, the crossroads aren't just, isn't just a major decision in your life. It, honestly, we, we go over crossroads every single day. Every single day, we're going over a crossroad. And the thing, I actually mentioned this earlier, the thing about these crossroads is it's not just, oh, I'm at a four-way stop, and I can go this way, I can go this way, and I can go straight. Or I guess I can go back up and go that way. That's not what we're talking about here. There are options. There are a lot of other options here at these crossroads. And he says, stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old, godly way and walk in it. You know, some translations will say, look, ask for the ancient paths, right? The ancient paths. So when we think about the word ancient and old, typically what we'll do is we'll think historical. That's ancient, it's old, it's happened, right? That's not what we're talking about here, though. He's not saying come up to a crossroads and look back to where you've been. He's saying ask for the ancient way. What he's saying is ask for the godly way. Ask for the eternal way. Because eternal isn't something that's behind you. It's something that's continuous. In fact, there is no time in eternity. So there is no historical context in eternity. There is no past in that. Time never was in eternity. And so he's, at, he's saying ask for the eternal way. There, there's a way when you're making a decision in your life, whether big or small, there is an eternal way, there is a godly way that's different from all the other options on the table right now. There is that way for every decision that we make, every one. And the thing is, it might look like, if you're looking out ahead, and let's just say there are eight different ways to go, you might see that eternal way, you might hear about it, you might read about it in God's Word, the Holy Spirit may bring that up to you, and you might see that way, and you think, man, that lo it looks kind of narrow over there. There's not a lot of people on that road going that way. And a lot of times, I mean, in the natural, like if you say you're going to an event or you're going somewhere, you're not really sure where it's at, what do you typically do? You follow the crowd. And this is happening in our lives right now where we typically, well, there's a lot of people kind of going this direction, and, you know, I don't, I'm just going to kind of jump in there because it's comfortable, and that's just, I mean, everyone else is doing that. I'll kind of blend in with them, right? 
And sadly, this is happening spiritually for us too. When we come up to a crossroads and we're not intentional about asking for that eternal way, for that godly way, oh, the crowd's over there. Yeah, but there's, there's a narrow road there. I know, I know that it's narrow. I know that it may be, may be more difficult there. And the thing, about the, the thing about that broad road over there is I can see a little bit further down it. I can look around. It's wide. I can see what's going on up ahead. I can't really see as much down here. I might have to live by faith if I go this way. And it may just be a step at a time. But if we know that that's God's way, we should have our decision then. We should. As God's people, we should have our decision then. Amen? And Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, if you can flip over there real quick. Matthew 7, 13, Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, because the wide gate and broad path is the way that leads to destruction. Nearly everyone chooses that crowded road. The narrow gate and the difficult way leads to eternal life. This is the same word for Zoe life, the God kind of life, the life that Jesus came to give us. So few even find it. So, this is the way that we want to go when we come to a crossroads. We want to go God's way, right? Yeah. We just sang about this. His way is better. If it's better, then it shouldn't matter what it looks like while we're standing at the crossroads. That should just be the step that we take. It's better. Let's continue in Jeremiah 6 here. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. But you reply, no, that's not the road we want. I posted watchmen over you who said, listen for the sound of the alarm. But you replied, no, we won't pay attention. Therefore, listen to this, all you nations. Take note of my people's situation. Listen, all the earth. I will bring disaster on my people. It is the fruit of what? Their own schemes. It is the fruit of their own schemes because they refuse to listen to me. They have rejected my word. Wow. They have refused to listen to me and they have rejected my word. I'll take you back to 2 Timothy 3 right now. What is the word of God good for? It's good for showing us what's right, telling, telling us what's wrong. It's good for correcting us, right? These things, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. It ends in verse 17 after that. And it's for equipping us and preparing us for every good work. And in 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, it says this. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God. Paul talking to Timothy still right after that. Uh, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will solemnly judge the living and dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and they'll look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. So these are the people who are coming to the crossroads, and they're ignoring the watchmen who are sounding the alarm right. when they show up. Right. And what, what they're doing is they, in fact, they'll, they'll go their own way because they're chasing their own desires, which is what Paul's telling us here. And what will happen at the next crossroads they go to, they'll want another watchman that will just tell them what they want to hear instead of what God said. And so they'll begin to surround themselves and they'll find themselves in places in their life where they're surrounding themselves with people who are not telling them what God said. They're not inquiring of God on their own. And so the Holy Spirit has nothing to draw on in them to bring them back to his word. And so the next watchman they run into is just like, Phew, yeah, man, that's, that's a great idea. Go that way. Hey, look, they're looking at all the people going over there. Just go do that. Just like everyone else. And if we're not careful, we'll fall into this trap ourselves if we don't keep... This is why, guys, this is why... This, it's not because I'm a staff member at Beyond Church and I care about small group stats. I couldn't tell you what the stats are. It's because of this right here. I care about you surrounding yourself with people you could call watchmen in your lives. When you come to a crossroads, you can rely on them to give you God's word and not some other word that you just want to hear to pet you, to make you feel better. That's not what the body of Christ is for. We're going to comfort you. Here's how we're going to comfort you, with the truth. That's right. The truth is the only thing that can comfort me. Don't tell me what I want to hear. 
give me the truth. If you love me, give me the truth. This is why relationships within Beyond Church, within the body of Christ, the local church that God's called you to, are vital. If not, you'll find that the majority of your relationships could be with people who aren't um, finding themselves in the Word of God and can be that watchman in your life. This is why, look, we know the statistics on this. This is why, what, you're, what, what's the stat about you're the, uh, uh, how many, the few friends that you hang around, you're basically that, right? You know what I'm saying? So this is why it's important who we're hanging around, who we're connected to. This is why it's important that I read my chapter every morning so when I come to a crossroads, oh, but I don't, I, there wasn't anything in that chapter that I need for today. Well, when I come to a crossroads, now there's something in there for the Holy Spirit. He's a watchman too to draw on and say, hey, this is what God's word says. Remember that? That's in there somewhere. Go this way. Right? So uh, we, we can't find ourselves in, like I said, in this echo chamber of surrounding ourselves with people who are going to tell us what we want to hear, who are just going to tell, agree with us. You, we read it there in, in 2 Timothy 4.1, a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They're going to follow their own desires and look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. What, what, happens, what happens to children when you just tell them whatever they want to hear and you say yes to everything they want? What happens to a child then? They become spoiled, entitled, and it makes you think about wanting to hit a child, is what it, right? <laughs> we haven't done it, but we've all been there. You thought about it. You're like, my kid will never be like that. Y'all have all said that, right? My, my kid will never be like that. And here we are sometimes. This is, this is, some, this is kind of what we're wanting. We don't, we're not saying yes to our children all the time. We know we can't. We know what that'll do. And yet we're kind of wanting to surround ourselves with people who will do that for us. And we'll, we'll end up the same way. Entitled and an entitled person, let me tell you something. An entitled person will never receive anything from God. You can't receive by grace what you think is owed to you, that you're entitled to. Right? All right, let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 6. Um, pick up in verse 19. Listen, all the earth, I will bring disaster on my people. It is the fruit of their own schemes. Because they refuse to listen to me, they have rejected my word. He goes on and says in verse 20, There's no use offering me sweet frankincense from Sheba. Keep your fragrant calamus imported from distant lands. I will not accept your burnt offerings your sacrifices have no pleasing aroma for me. What did Pastor Nate taught about this, sacrifice and obedience, a few weeks ago. Go to 1 Samuel, where, where, we, where we read about this a few weeks ago. 1 Samuel chapter 15 says, But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord? Remember, this, this was after, after the Lord gave directions through the prophet Samuel to Saul about what he was to go do, and Saul didn't do what he was told to do. He did. He went his own way. He, he did what he wanted to do. He, he thought what he did was better than what God said. And that's what he did. And like he was convinced of that somehow. Samuel comes to him and says, what's more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. Say this with me. Obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than the offering of fat rams. Submission is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. He goes on and says rebellion. You know what rebellion is? Disobedience. Disobedience is rebellion, is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Listen, sacrifices to the Lord are great, but not apart from your obedience. It is not an exchange for your obedience. Would God rather you 
do what he's telling you to do and find you down the road and the path that he has for you? Or is he okay with you just going your own way because that's where you want to go, but along the way you'll find time to make sacrifices to him? You're going the wrong way. You're on the path of destruction, and God loves you so much. He doesn't want you down there. Your sacrifices don't mean anything. What he cares about is your obedience to him because it'll find you in the place that's best for you. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Sacrifice is great so long as our obedience is first. Amen. What aroma is God looking for? He likes the aroma of heaven. He likes his own brand. He likes what he made. It's his. Well, we just talked about it earlier. This word is inspired by God. It is the essence of God. The sights, the sounds, the power, everything that heaven is, is right here. And this, this is what's pleasing to God, is when we obey this and we do this. Not the, not the, sacri- uh, the aroma from our sacrifices. Somebody say, give me truth. Give me the truth. So, we stop at the crossroads and we tell the watchman, what do we tell the watchman? Give me the truth. Which, which way here? Give me the truth. You think the watchmen are going to tell you, you can't handle the truth? <laughs> They're not going to tell you that. You can handle the truth if you want to. If you want to. That road may look a little narrow, narrower. It may look a little harder. It may look like it will require you to live by faith. But again, this is what we want. What, what, what is a life of faith? A life of faith is the only type of life that's pleasing to God. A life of faith. So let's look at some alarms that the, the watchmen in our lives, again, these are, these, this is the word of God getting in us every day. This is the Holy Spirit bringing God's word to our members. This is the body of Christ, the people that we're connected to, serving as watchmen in our lives. What are they, what are we sounding the alarms on for people when they're at a crossroads? Let's look at some examples here. We're going to go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. I think that's right. 2 Timothy 3, 1. Yep. You should know this, Timothy. Say, come on, Timothy. You should know this. All right, just making sure y'all are participating. In the last days, there will be very difficult times. We've heard this, haven't we? Let's talk about some last day stuff. In the last days, do you think we're in the last days? We've had some difficult and perilous times. We're in the last days right now. He says, for people will only love themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Whoa, whoa, hey, hey, watch it, watch it. Don't, down that road, listen, down that road, those people consider nothing sacred. The, like, the Sabbath means nothing to them. The, nothing is sacred to them. Uh, they, they're, uh, um, Bible reading is, is if they get to it. That's not sacred to them. Down that road, their service to God is on their terms. This is what a watchman's saying in our life right now. Y'all get what I'm doing here? This is what the watchman is saying. These are examples of things that are happening, and when we tend to think about what's going on in the end times, we're thinking about we're here, we're the church, we're this, we're the light, and then there's the world over here, and this is what all the people look like over here. No, 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 no. We can find ourselves doing these very same things. This is called deception, thinking that we're okay when we're not okay. This is why this is a checkup tonight. This is a check to see where, how, how am I doing? Do I have do I have these guards in my life? Do I have these watchmen in my life? Who, If I try to go the wrong way, there's something there that's saying, uh, it's called a check, a check from the Holy Spirit saying, don't go that way. Down that, if you go down that path and start doing that, you'll, you'll start to think that nothing is sacred just like they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's got to, uh, listen, this is, this is what's going to be happening in the end times. Uh, this is describing people. They will consider nothing sacred. Let that not be said of us. 
that we don't consider anything sacred. They'll be unloving and forgiving. Verse 3, they'll slander others. They'll have no self-control. Hey, don't go down that path. Those people have no self-control. They'll just end up pulling you down to be just like them because they have no self-control. Guess what's going to happen to you if you go down that path? You probably won't be exercising self-control, even though it's a fruit of your recreated spirit. Self-control is. I tell my daughter this all the time. You know, when they get angry or whatever happens, I was like, you know, you can control. Don't tell me that you can't control yourself. You can control yourself. Daddy can't control himself. Sometimes it doesn't look like it, but I can control myself. It's a fruit of my spirit. We talk about this. Pastor says this. You know, it's, the fruits of the spirit are pretty stinking easy to walk in when I'm just all by myself, right? It's when I get around you people that the, just kidding, you guys make it easy, right? You guys make it easy. But it's when we get around people and there's a rub now that let's see, let's see if the fruit of the Spirit is, is really there like it's supposed to be, right? Guess what? It is there. It is there. And this is a road that we have to choose to walk down. I'm going to walk in self-control. I can control myself. I can. Verse 4. They will betray their friends. They'll be reckless. They'll be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. Hey, y'all, I think I would think twice about going down that way. Those people, the people down that way, I know it's kind of crowded down there, but those people, they love themselves more than they love God. And you think, man, I don't, I, I could never love myself more than I love God. And, and yet we're choosing and preferring ourself and what we want in this moment over God a lot of times in our everyday life. And it's one of those things where we, we don't need to be afraid to admit this. Sometimes you just need to admit it. In this instance, I chose myself over God because at least that way we're not deceiving ourselves. And here's the beautiful thing about God is that if I start going down this way where I, where I chose myself over God, and we're going to read a scripture here in a, in a second where it's talking about, or at the end where it's talking about people who are departing from the faith, they're turning from the faith, and a lot of times we read things like that, like they departed and they left, and they ain't coming back. But the beautiful thing about turning away from something is just as quickly as I turned away from God, I can just turn right back to him this way, and I can get back to the crossroads there, and then I can choose the path that he told me to go on. This is what repentance is. You're going one way, and now it's not, it's not anything crazy, spiritual. It's, it's a decision. I'm now turning back around. This is repentance, and I'm going back. And I'm coming back to God, and I'm saying, God, where, am I, where did you want me to go now? I want to choose, I want to choose your way. Your way is better. Your way is better. This is good stuff. This is good. God's word is good. It's so good. All right, let's look at um, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we're going to read uh, verse 18 through 25. It says, For God in heaven unveils his holy anger, breaking forth against every form of sin both toward ungodliness that lives in hearts and evil actions. For the wickedness of humanity deliberately smothers the truth and keeps people from acknowledging the truth about God. You know, the smothering of truth, it's not that the truth isn't out there. It's that it's, be, it's deliberately being smothered right now. And it's at an all-time high in our world. And this, this really puts the onus back on us as the church. Our job as the church, as Christ's body, we have to be all the more vocal about the truth, the truth of God's word. And look, this is something that I, you know, I honestly dropped the ball on this. I mean, we need to know, we really need to know um, about the, the hot button topics in our culture today. You know, you hear about them, you form your opinions on them based on whatever it is, whether it's based on how you grew up, what you were taught, right? We need to form, regardless of all that, whether that was good or not, you need to form our opinions on those things based on God's word, right? 
But it is very important for us to know what we believe. I mean, I've taken a wrong approach to this, I mean, and not even that long ago about some of this stuff, where it's just kind of the approach of like, you know, just live and let live. Like, you do you, I'll do me, this is what I believe, you believe whatever you want. And that type of attitude that the church has had is what has allowed this slide in our culture to get to this point right here. And it's on the church. Because we didn't want to ruffle feathers, because we had the wrong definition of what love is, we've allowed, we've allowed the truth of God's word to go this way instead of holding the truth up right here and making people live their lives according to the truth. Not that we can make people, but this is what we're presenting right here. And this is on us. And, and we have to know what we believe. It's important. You have to know what you believe. And I love uh, what Pastor Nate, uh, this was um, in his message. Y'all, it was a Wednesday night, I think. It was called Mirror, Mirror. Were y'all here for that message? If not, and even if you were, you guys need to go listen to that again. You need to get on the app, and you need to go listen to that message again. And in that, he said, the, tru- the truth is, we don't decide what's right or wrong. We decide who's Lord. And this is where we've gotten off. We're getting into debates with people about what's right or wrong, thinking, uh, just arrogant enough to think that either one of us have the right to choose what's right or wrong. We, we don't choose what's right or wrong. We choose what's been set before us. We choose who's Lord. God said, I've set before you life and blessing, death and cursing. Then he told us what to choose. Hey, he said, choose life. But I don't get to decide what death and cursing really is, what all of that entails. That's, I, don't get that. I don't get to do that. I just get to choose what's been put in front of me. Who's going to be Lord of my life, Right? That's my choice. This type of thinking, knowing that, look, it's not up to you, it's not up to me to decide what's right and wrong, it'll free you up to be bold about what you believe. Because we're not debating with people about what's right or wrong. Like, don't, don't debate with me. Like, this is what I believe. You, like, God is the one who's, who's setting what's right or wrong. Oh, well, I don't believe in God. Well, that, I, that doesn't matter. <laughs> but you don't believe in God. And, and here's the thing about Romans. Romans is telling us that, uh, did we even read that in, in verse 18? It, it was actually before that. Let me turn there real quick and see. You got your Bibles, you can flip over to Romans 1. Um, no, I, didn't, I don't think I got there yet, did I? Let's pick back up in verse 19. So it was part of what we were going to read. All right, so in reality, the truth of God is known instinctively, for God has embedded this knowledge inside every human heart. Opposition to truth cannot be excused on the basis of ignorance because from the creation of the world, the invisible qualities of God's nature have been made visible, such as his eternal power and transcendence. He has made his wonderful attributes easily perceived, for seeing the visible makes us understand the invisible. So then, this leaves everyone without excuse. Say everyone. Throughout human history, the fingerprints of God were upon them, yet they refused to honor him as God or even be thankful for his kindness. Instead, they entertained corrupt and foolish thoughts about what God was like. This left them with nothing but misguided hearts steeped in moral darkness. Are there any misguided hearts steeped in moral darkness in our world today? There's a lot. Although claiming to be wise, they were in fact shallow fools. And um, you shared a, my mom shared a message yesterday from Rick Renner. Um, so if you know Rick Renner, he's like um, Mr. Greek. And he like, so the New Testament was written in Greek. And so you got to go back to the original Greek to know how, you know, what things were really said. And he said, basically a literal translation of this scripture right here, although claiming to be wise, they were in fact shallow fools. Here's how it would read in the Greek. 
Claiming to be progressive thinkers, they were in fact morons. That's basically what the, what the Greek says. My, I, have a, I have a progressive way of thinking that's above, that's above any of this right here. It's progressive. God doesn't have to be progressive. God is God. And God's way is the best way from the beginning. It could not be improved. So for us to think that we're progressive thinkers now, and we're going to improve on what was, we're in fact morons. And we need to go back to Moron Mountain. That's a Space Jam reference for the only Space Jam. I do not acknowledge Space Jam 2. That is, I mean, didn't see it, but I'm not giving it a chance either. So, anyway, that's not us. Say, that's not me. I'm not a moron. Amen. Praise God. We learned something about ourselves tonight. Verse 22, for only a fool, only a moron would trade the unfading splendor of the immortal God to worship the fading image of other humans, idols made to look like people, animals, birds, and even creeping reptiles. And this was something that Rick Renner was talking about too, you know, when it's talking about the worshiping of idols here, talking about uh, we're trading, this is what we're doing, we're walking away from that river and we're going to build our own well, and we're trading the unfading splendor of the immortal God to worship the fading image of other humans, idols made to look like people, animals, birds, and even creeping reptiles. And he said, really, what this is here, this is um, a history of idolatry in one verse. Because like from the, well, you go way back, and, and people were making idols out of bugs and snakes and reptiles, and then they moved on to cows and four-legged creatures and, and things. And then they went ahead and, you know, you get to the Roman Empire, and it was all about the eagle, right? Like that was the insignia of the Roman Empire is the eagle. And so that, that's their idol now. Now uh, a lot of people's idols are just humans. In fact, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, choosing uh, pleasure for themselves over God. It's them, we, become, we can become our own idol. When we're choosing what we want over what God says, that's what we're doing. It's men, they're worshiping themselves. You know, you know the worship of, of self is like what Satanism is? That, that is Satanism. It's It's self. And, you know, the, the reason it's like that is because that's Satan. That is how he became Satan. I, I will ascend into the Most High. I will, I, will, I will set my throne above the stars of God, and I will be like the Most I, 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 I will, I, I, I. It was about I. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what Satanism is. It's, all, it's the worship of self. All right, let's close up with this. First Timothy chapter 4. We're in, we're in Timothy a lot. A lot of good stuff here written to Timothy. First Timothy 4, we're going to read in verse 1. It says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. And so this is just going again back to we actually already covered this about turning away from the faith. And this may be one of those scriptures that you've read before where you think that this is like, man, they made their decision. But if, if someone turned away, if I depart from this stage and go out that door, I departed from something, I can return. And so this is for you. If you feel like you, you're there, you've been there, this is for your family members. If you feel like they've taken a path that is absolutely contrary to what God's word says, that does not mean that it's the end for them. Absolutely not. God's word and God's promises are for them, and they can make a decision. Look, and this is why we pray that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened so that they can see the hope to which they've been called, right? That their understanding, would not, that, that they wouldn't just be enlightened to what they can see and what they can come up with on their own, that their eyes would see God's word 
right? The truth, that they would see the truth and that the truth, what will the truth do for them? It will set them free. And they can now, oh, the truth has set me free. I feel like I've been in a trance going this way, but now I've seen the truth and I can turn around and I can get back to this place where I can say, God, which, where, which way? Which is the right way? And that family member, that friend, that loved one, they can get right back on the path that God has for them. If that's you, same thing. Repentance is not uh, an emotion. It is a decision. And once you have God's word, which we've shared tonight, you can make that decision. You can make it. Thank you, Lord. All right, let's close up with this. Back to Jeremiah chapter 6, please. We're just going to start back in 16 and read that first verse. This is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old, godly way and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. That's what we're going to do, isn't it? We're going to, whatever crossroads that we're at in our life, Whatever that may be, whether it's, whether it's a new thing, whether it's something we've never been up against before, whether it's something that we keep coming to. I feel like I've been at this crossroads before. I know that road. I keep going down that road. Somehow I keep ending up right back here. I've been down that road here too. Okay, listen, but when we're at this crossroads now, there is a way that we can choose. That when we go forward, we won't find ourselves back here again. Because it's God's way. It's the eternal way. And so every day, there are decisions that, that we're making where we can ask for that way. And listen, guys, I want to go back and I want to reiterate, this is why it's so important. Get connected with the people here. Get connected to the people you're sitting next to. Get connected to someone who will give you the truth. Say it. Say, give me the truth. Because we love each other, we're going to give each other the truth. Guys, if we want to see these seats filled up, then we have got to begin living this way. Our lives are not going to look like the world because we're giving each other the truth and we're responding to God's way and we're walking in God's way. Why? Because his way is better. Your way is better. We're walking that way. We're going, we're going, to, be, we're going to be so far separate from the world we're not supposed to look the same. We, we hear this. We're not supposed to look the same from the world. Why not? Because we're on different roads. We're going different directions. And the people that we come in contact to in our world, on our job, right? We're there for them now. And we can become a watchman for them. They're just waiting for that one person who will give them the truth. Now, in 2023, people are looking for truth more than they ever have before. The middle, the middle of what, uh, you can either choose this or you can choose this. The middle is shrinking because people are looking for something. We need to be the one that's louder. We need to be the one that's giving the people the truth and not a lie. And not a lie. I was listening to a podcast that was talking about really the end of atheism and how atheism is going to start dying out because this generation, the generations that's been, that's been coming up, got, they're, they're looking for what they want. They're looking for answers. They're not looking to not believe something. They're looking for something to believe. We've got what they want. We've got what they need to believe. We've got to become the watchman in our life for others, right? In order to effectively do that, we've got to have the right watchman in our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Aren't you thankful for God's word? I'm thankful for it. And I'm thankful for, for everyone in here. I'm thankful that, that we uh, together deem this type of stuff important where you show up and we get taught, we get trained, right? And we're equipped. This is what God's word does. It has now equipped us for every good work. There are good works that you're to do. There are good works that you're to do, and this is how you get equipped to do them, right? Let's pray, and we're going to be dismissed tonight. Let's just ask the Lord to help us put this word into practice. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, and we just thank you for your word.
Your word is life to us. Your word is light. And where there may have been any darkness, I thank you that light was shed there tonight. And I thank you that decisions can now be made in that light. There are not decisions being made now in the darkness. There is light, which means there's answers. Answers come when light comes. And so we thank you that the answers are, are now are there. They're, they're ready to be seen. Uh, and I thank you that they're there for, for us right now. Answers. Answers. Thank you for answers, Lord. And I thank you for your grace and for your mercy that's new every morning. That even when we choose the wrong path, by your grace and mercy, we can repent and we can turn and we can find ourselves right back at this crossroad where you give us uh, that word, the word that we need to take the path that you're calling us to. Thank you, Lord. Father, I ask for grace for everyone in here to take these steps, to, to be bold enough to ask themselves, Lord, what crossroad am I at? The decisions I'm making, what decision do I need to make differently? If I've been back at this crossroad again, what, what's, the, what's the way I'm asking you for the eternal path? I'm asking you for the godly way. Which way is that, Lord? And I'll go that way. I'll go your way. I know that your way is better, and I declare I will go that way. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the people in my life serving as watchmen to give me the truth. Thank you, Lord. Father, we love you. We love your word, and we're thankful for it. In Jesus' name. Amen.